Okay. On logistics, then, thanks so much for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, very much uh, talking about a project or ideas of a project uh, Martin and I developed uh, one and a half years ago or so when he was granted a honorary professorship, a research professor position at the Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies at uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, as we all know, unfortunately, this never materialized, but until the very end, we were in close contact uh, talking about this project. And uh, you know, what I would like to do is uh, giving you some of those ideas, but also sharing some of the concerns both of us discussed. And I would start to, with the tourism, uh, something uh, I think that we all share, and that's uh, the statement that liberal democracies are under a threat from inside as well as from outside. And the threat has a name. There may be a lot of challenges, but this particular threat has a name. It's populism and economic nationalism. Those two features come in various uh, variants. You know, you find it in different versions, not only in Europe, in other parts of the world too, but they are really here. And we have to deal with them in one way or the other. When it comes to Europe, for a long time it was widely assumed that the project of European integration eventually would bring people together across national borders that are sharing values, uh, democratic norms, and also benefit from all those economic advantages coming due to cooperation, and all this would lead to overcome this ugly phase of nationalism. Borders would disappear, and a new post-nation-state entity, usually we name it as the European Union, uh, would emerge. All this happened, but times have changed. When the turbulences came up, everything we were sure that is settled and fixed has come into fluidity. Nationalism is back, and so is populism. And the nation state is now again seen as the entity, the ground for all this kind of interest, power interest, and struggles. Something we thought so, at least in the European case, would have behind us is back on the agenda. And all those developments, to some degree at least, work against the core principles of open societies. In other words, Populism and eco economic nationalism is a digressive project that is also changing the whole space in which cultural institutions operate. Now, the very late Martin wrote, I recall a couple of walks we had, was actually one a year ago or so, very optimistic uh, when he looked at the emerging social and political movements that emerged as a response to all those backlashes we had to observe. So it was hope uh, he would try to see, and this was also part of his character, not only being pessimistic, always seeing hope at the same time. Now, as we know from today's experience, you know, things are moving very quickly, very fast. Uh, I recall one and a half years ago, there was this huge thing, even from Vancouver perspective, Willkommenskultur in Germany, and if we look at it from today's perspective, there's not a lot of the commons culture left over. The problems are shifting enormously quickly. So this kind of optimism we needed in order to act and to move forward. At the same time, it's questioned from all sides. If one believes in long political cycles, one can argue that a long cycle of integration and convergence in Europe that started after World War II is coming to an end and makes space for a long cycle of diversion and disintegration. Now, this is a hypothesis, but it can happen. Imagine that we are at this kind of turning point. It's not only a few events we're observing today, but it's the start of a longer cycle where we see things emerging and developing in a different way. This turning point, I would argue, has, a, has its roots in this phase of hyper-globalization that already started in the 1980s and that generated 
clear defined groups of losers, absolute losers and relative losers in economic terms. Even though globalization was a process and still in many respects is a process that is producing net benefits for the overall society, the question is how are they distributed? We had this uh, in the round before, somebody was mentioning inequality on a global level. This inequality problem is sticking uh, with us and has its root in this kind of period. Now, it needs always triggers to make out of those processes something very difficult. Hyperglobalization could go on and on without any uh, larger problems, but triggers are really changing the whole path. And I would only name, I think, so two triggers we all are aware of. Uh, the one uh, is uh, the financial crisis of 2008 that turned into the zero zone crisis and really mixed up Europe and the integration process of Europe and solidarity, what it's all about, in enormous ways. Europe after the Eurozone crisis from 2010 following is no longer the same Europe than before. That's the one element. The other one is 2015, but already this started earlier, the so-called migration crisis, uh, the number of people leaving their countries for a variety of reasons has increased enormously and due to the fact that Europe has the longest outer border, 14,000 kilometers, much more than the United States of America, for example, it's becoming difficult to deal with those borders in any good way. And this is causing problems. And those two triggers, I would argue, really uh, changed uh, the way political actors are looking to the, to the ongoing situation and try to find ways to deal with the problems and to move forward. So nationalism and narrow-minded identity politics have become key elements of political actors today. And you know, we all know it's not only a question of extremist parties. Uh, those kind of sentiments and feelings are getting mainstreamed. The more the problems, the stronger the problems are getting, the more key center of political parties are accepting under the pressure of the public and on the media to take positions they wouldn't have taken, let us say, two, three years earlier. So it's a kind of mainstreaming process, process that is uh, getting and making the problem so difficult. And one way to look at it is the project of European integration has lost its narrative. In some regard, we are We've taken it as given for quite a long time. In other ways, it's pretty clear the narrative that has been in place that was legitimizing all those kind of decisions and processes that were uh, to observe. This narrative was not really strong enough to deal with turbulent times. And now we are in a situation that Europe tries and European politicians try to find ways out of this situation, but no longer have the strengths of those narratives around with, with which they can work and convince broader segments of the population to really move forward. So creating a new balance between openness on the one side and national interest on the other side is a very difficult task. And I think so, this task goes far beyond my own expertise, for example, in economics and political science. It also needs participation, interventions on the side of culture. Culture and arts operate with a different logic than markets and states. Markets operate with the logic of money, states operate with the logic of power. And culture is not supposed to operate with those two media, put it this way. So we need to find ways to express ourselves, and I think so, this, if you had had a chance, this small book, The Conversation of Martin with His uh, Kids, has also just public, been published in English, Wiederrede, Talk Back in English, is a way to see those interventions have to happen not only on the big political stage. They can start with friends and the family to really create this kind of narrative that is necessary, the undercurrent that we are finding ways out of those difficult situations that still preserve democratic values and uh, try to build up a common good, a common public good in Europe and across Europe uh, rather than only narrow-minded national interests. 
And I think so this is pretty much the kind of way Martin was acting in many, many areas, at least the area and the way I learned and from him. And uh, it would be it's too bad that he's no longer with us because we need those kind of people in those times uh, very urgently. Thanks so much.